There are over 10 million online searches each month for information regarding domestic violence in just the U.S. and Canada. Anyone, regardless of gender, sexuality, race, or religion, can experience abuse. Domestic abuse isn't always physical violence. It can be emotional, verbal, even financial. It can feel isolating and hopeless. For victims, it often takes several attempts to escape an abusive partner. There are many reasons victims are often afraid to reach out for help, including embarrassment or denial, being isolated from family and friends, or fear of losing their children. But if you're experiencing abuse, you're not alone. It's not your fault. Help is here for you. DomesticShelters.org is the leading domestic violence online resource where abuse victims and survivors can find everything they need to take steps towards safety, all in one place. With DomesticShelters.org's searchable database of domestic violence programs and shelters in the U.S. and Canada, anyone can find a nearby trained advocate who cares, along with support and resources. Victims of abuse may not be ready to connect with an advocate yet, but with DomesticShelters.org's comprehensive library of relevant and high-quality content, it's simple to find information that can help change lives for the better. Domestic violence professionals and advocates rely on DomesticShelters.org for ways to better support their local communities through free online expert-led training, award and grant programs, donation tools, and other powerful resources. The profound impact of domestic violence hurts everyone. Victims lose hope. Children suffer lifelong trauma. Communities are permanently damaged. That's why millions of people come to DomesticShelters.org to get the answers and help that they need. And why 8 out of 10 DomesticShelters.org visitors share their newfound knowledge with others, exponentially increasing public awareness of abuse. Your support helps connect those millions of victims and survivors of domestic violence with the resources they need to identify, escape, and heal from abuse. If you aren't sure where to turn, we're here to help you feel safe again, wherever you are on your journey. Please visit us at DomesticShelters.org. All right. Welcome, everyone, to today's presentation. My name is Ashley Rumschlag. And I am the CEO and president of DomesticShelters.org and Teresa's Fund. I am joined today uh, by Rachel Myers, our digital services specialist, and Hannah Craig, our vice president of content, who will be monitoring, monitoring the chat and Q&A throughout the presentation. Uh, we are so excited to be hearing from so many wonderful presenters to discuss using technology to improve the journey to support. Today's webinar will be 90 minutes. Just a few housekeeping items before we dive into today's conversation. Uh, we are offering live closed captionings for today's webinar. Uh, to turn those on, please click more in the menu and select show subtitles. Uh, we will also provide a transcript of today's presentation within one week. Just a reminder, you are in listen-only mode, so your video and your audio are turned off. If you'd like to communicate with the, the other uh, attendees, please use the chat and then use the, the Q&A box to ask questions of our, our presenters. We will save some time at the end uh, for questions. And just a reminder, we will email a certificate of attendance, a transcript, and the webinar play, playback recording, uh, along with a list of any links or resources mentioned in today's presentation. And we'll send those to everyone who's logged in within one week of today's presentation. And then next week, uh, Rachel's going to drop a link in the chat to next week's webinar, which is going to be with uh, Sybil Cumming uh, on surviving post-separation abuse, supporting survivors after escaping domestic violence. Uh, and that is going to be next week at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 a.m. Eastern. And that is sponsored by our friends at Thread Talk. And then just a reminder that if you uh, would like additional training from DomesticShelters.org, we do have a large library of content available to you. Um, you're welcome to check out our library at DomesticShelters.org webinars. 
and we can issue a certificates of attendance, just email us at info at domesticshelters.org. Uh, there's the email address there. Um, this is also um, for our call in listeners. I'll say that one more time. Make sure to send us an, in, an email to info at domesticshelters.org and we'll add you to the, uh, the list of attendees for today's webinar. Um, if you're logged in on Zoom on your phone or your computer, um, we do have your email address. So that's just for those who are simply calling in to listen today. All right, and just a big thank you to No More um, for putting together today's conversation. If you're not familiar with No More, they are a global organization dedicated to ending domestic violence and sexual assault by increasing awareness, inspiring action, and fueling cultural change. All right. And in last week's webinar, you may recall, um, we talked about technology-enabled abuse. Um, this webinar is meant to be a space to talk about how technology can actually be used to support victims and survivors of abuse. Specifically, um, we're going to talk about the Bright Sky app, which uses the domestic shelters.org database to help victims and survivors of abuse to find their local programs. We do have a fantastic lineup of panelists joining us today. Um, and I do want to give a moment to just introduce each and every one of them and share a little bit about who they are and kind of where their perspective is coming from. Um, so here's all of their photos right here. We're just going to kind of run through them. Um, so we do have Nicole Molinaro and Kristen Brown from the Women's Center and Shelter of Greater, Greater Pittsburgh. Um, this organization serves over 7,700 uh, 7, adults and children each year with comprehensive service, services. Um, they also help provide healing and hope in any, for anyone experiencing domestic violence. Uh, Nicole is their president and CEO. Um, she has been involved with them for over 25 years, first as a volunteer and then on their staff. Nicole is proud to have worked for WCNS in various uh, capacities, including their training center manager, director of development, and chief programs officer uh, before she was promoted to CEO. Uh, she has a bachelor's of arts and master's of arts in psychology from Okanas. Duke. Nicole, can you help me out here? Duquesne. Duquesne University. Duquesne. Oh my gosh, I should know that. <laughs> Thank you. I'll continue on. Uh, and is an alumni of the Leadership of Pittsburgh uh, De Leadership Development in Initiative, uh, the Harvard Graduate School of Business Programs on Strategic Perspectives and Nonprofit Management and Coros Leaders in Learning Program. Uh, Kristen Brown is their Chief Development Officer. Uh, she has over 20 years of experience in development uh, and is currently um, so yeah, so she's currently the, the chief development officer. And that before then she served as their director of development and marketing for the Early Learning Institute and the development and communication director for Pittsburgh Cares. She has an undergrad degree in communications from Robert Morris University and master's degree in professional le leadership with a concentration in nonprofit management from Carlo uh, University. Uh, we also have Phil Kostler, who is the Managing Director of the App Development and Integration at Aspirant. Um, Phil is the Technology Director with a focus on providing enterprise-grade solutions. His 30 years of experience have given him the opportunity to work across many markets, industries, and applications. Phil and his team have facilitated the development of two domestic violence apps and websites, the Are You Safe and Bright Sky. Um, from beginning to end. He also serves on the board of directors of Women's Center and Shelters of Greater, excuse me, Women's Center and Shelter of Greater Pittsburgh. And finally, or next we have uh, Sarah DeAngelis, who is the programs manager of UK, UK Says No More and Safe Spaces Hestia. Uh, Sarah DeAngelis is, uh, so she creates survivor-led partnership-based solutions for domestic abuse and sexual violence. She co-created 16 Days, 16 Films, a multi-country short VAWG film initiative, and the National Safe Spaces and Online Safe Spaces Scheme, in increasing pathways for survivors to access special specialist support and safe safely. Uh, over for over 15 years, Sarah has been committed to amplifying survivors' voices and changing the societal narrative that exists around sexual violence, having previously founded a rape crisis center and fulfilled consultancy roles both nationally and internationally. Next, we have uh, June Sugiyama of Vodafone America's Foundation. 
June has been in corporate philanthropy sector for over 20 years, specializing in identifying the power of technology for social good. She's led the Vodafone America's Foundation's transition towards empowering women and girls through technology, aligning programs with Vodafone's expertise in technology and innovation. She also created the, the Foundation's Wireless Innovation Project, a competition designed to seek the best wireless technology to address global critical global issues. The program identified 30 entrepreneurs who are impacting over 65 million lives addressing poverty, health, environmental environment, disaster relief, and technology access. Since then, the program has been transitioned to partnership with MIT Solve. Uh, Hannah Hollander is the founder and executive director of Speak Your Truth Today. Uh, Hannah Hollander is the founder, uh, so, so excuse me, after uh, escaping abuse in 2018, Hannah shared her story on Facebook, hoping to educate her community about domestic violence. The post went viral and was shared over 123,000 times. Overwhelmed with the response, she created Speak Your Truth, a private gender inclusive Facebook support group, which now serves over 18,000 survivors worldwide. Uh, through abuse education, networking resources, and providing emotional support, Speak Your Truth Today has been able to help about three people every week leave abusive relationships. I'll also add in there that Hannah Hollander is also a Purple Ribbon Award winner, uh, so we're so glad to have her here today as well. So those are all of our panelists we're going to have today, um, and I will finally uh, end with leading, or excuse me, introducing Lindsay Dearlove, who's going to facilitate Director of Operations, excuse me, Global Director Operations of No More. Uh, she's a passionate advocate for social justice with almost 20 years of experience addressing and preventing domestic and sexual violence. She led Hestia's response to uh, the DA Act of uh, Act 2021, championing the recognition of children and protecting status and for an uh, employer response. Over 160 MPs and parliamentarians joined the call to action. In 2016, she set up and led the UK chapter of No More. In addition, Lindsay led the development of Safe Spaces, an initiative that allows people experiencing DV to safely and discreetly get help when they go to participating pharmacies and banks. She co-created Online Safe Spaces, an online portal used over 1 million times, but also provides discreet specialist DV support. Uh, welcome, Lindsay, and everyone on the panel today. We are so glad to have everyone. Um, we'll go ahead and turn it over to Lindsay, who's going to, to uh, facilitate this wonderful conversation um, with all these wonderful people. So welcome, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ashley, and I appreciate you going through and introducing us so beautifully. And um, there was a lot of introductions and a lot of tongue twisting sentences in that. <laughs> well, I, pre I appreciate the grace that you've given me. I, I wanted to do, my, do right by everyone because I know I'm just I'm, I'm so enamored by the work that everyone on this panel has done and um, just so so um, from everyone today. So welcome everyone. Welcome to turn your, your cameras and your microphones on. I'm going to step aside, but I'll come back in um, as questions come in and of course at the end to kind of tie things up with a formal Q&A session. Thank you so much. And, you know, a massive thank you to yourself, Ashley, and DomesticShelters.org and all of you that have joined us today to enable us to have this conversation and explore some of the, the sort of tech solutions that we're putting forward, but also, and perhaps most importantly, for us to take a minute to really understand and examine that journey to support that those that are enduring domestic abuse experience. So to start off the conversation and what feels the right place to start it in a way is, is to invite Hannah um, to answer and sort of give a small little shortish explanation if you can I know that it's it's an incredible project that requires a lot of information um, a lot of time but so I feel terrible saying it that way but you know speak your truth when I met you last year I was overwhelmed with the power and and the compassion and, and the passion that comes from your members to work together many of them who were volunteers to create a safe space online for those that are enduring domestic abuse to get the support that they need from fellow survivors can you tell us a little bit about where it came from, how it's set up, and perhaps a little bit of reflection on how you manage the group in that sense of community. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm so excited to be here. So thank you so much um, for inviting me to come on and, and talk a little bit more about Speak Your, speak your Truth. See, I can't even say it. <laughs> speak Your Truth today. Um, and, uh, and I really think that Speak Your Truth is a, a perfect example as to 
how impactful online spaces and, and technology can be in a journey in the survivor's journey out of abuse. So, um, so super excited to be here and explain a little bit more about our community. So um, as Ashley mentioned, um, it all kind of got started when I shared my own story on Facebook. Um, you know, I was in a very uh, angry stage in my um, escape from abuse and was like, why are, is no one talking about you know, this stuff in my community. And, and so I shared my own story and in hopes to really educate my community. And it kind of had a life of its own after that. Um, I was very overwhelmed with the response. And so I uh, kind of on a whim made this little Facebook group to, um, to kind of capture some of the survivors um, in the comments that um, really just wanted to share their own stories. And, um, and so that's kind of where it came from. Um, but then we had 12,000 members in two weeks. So, um, so it was just really a wild time there at the beginning, but um, I had a bunch of people reach out to me individually and, and offer to help admin and, and volunteers support um, the group to really create it uh, into this safe space that we all wanted um, to uh, support each other in, in our journeys of healing. And so, um, so we were able to really do that. And now four years later, you know, it's turned into this um, incredibly empowering space um, you know, like, like it was mentioned, it's all survivors in the, in the support group itself. We call it a support group, even though it's a little bit different than the, the standard in-person support group, but it very much, um, is that peer-to-peer -peer support. All the, the content that is shared within the group, um, are from members, um, and, uh, and survivors themselves. So, um, so it really, uh, like, the, the group itself, uh, inside the group, you know, um, we can talk about really anything that the survivor uh, is dealing with. And, and what's so great about the group is that um, it really has survivors at all walks of their journey out of abuse. So, um, you know, some of them are out 20 years and just wanting to give back. And, um, and you don't really find that space um, anywhere else in a survivor's journey out of abuse with the resources that are currently out there. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, it's just really turned into this very beautiful space that, um, that I think has had an impact on a lot of survivors journeys out of abuse. Yeah. Thank you. Then. And I, I would second that. I think there's that opportunity that not meeting someone in person can potentially give the, you know, the space for you to feel that you can disclose more about yourself, ask questions that perhaps if you were face to face would be a little bit more difficult. And I think we're seeing more and more that, you know, 15, 20 years ago, the only way to access support, for example, was to phone a telephone helpline or hotline. And now we know that as, you know, younger people come into needing support, that actually text-based solutions are perhaps the first stages and, and being able to sort of have those slightly anonymized conversations can be incredibly powerful. But in saying all of that, I think it's important that we recognize that there are barriers to accessing this support. And, you know, some of that is about control and coercion and not being having, you know, not having your own mobile phone or not being able to access the internet. So I think it's important that we take a, mo a moment to recognize that that happens. And that is, that is, so technology works for every, not for everyone, but for most people. But in saying all of that, what do you feel that some of the advantages have been or put forward by your group for being able to talk within that type of space? Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, of course, you know, just like you said, there, there are barriers and there's barriers for a lot of people, especially those that. So, so one thing that we have found with our group is that we can actually target survivors that are still in relationships. And that's something that I think is very unique in the domestic violence space, because a lot of places can't help until after the survivor has chosen to leave. And as we all know, that's a very long process. And so with, with our group, you know, being able to really capture those survivors um, that, that have just started, you know, thinking about escaping or thinking that this is abuse, you know, it was actually my, my the very first thing that I did when I was, you know, in a fog, not understanding what my, um, you know, ex-partner was, was doing to me, I actually turned to Google and said, is my husband abusive? You know, I, I didn't understand what I was experiencing. And, um, and now we're able to capture those, those people that do turn online to start asking those questions. 
Um, and, you know, luckily my, my ex was um, not very um, controlling of technology. And that's a huge issue. That's, the, you know, going to be the biggest barrier is, is um, a, an a abusive person that controls the technology. But the advantage is, is so great because it's extremely accessible. We actually find that um, oh, in a recent survey, actually, we, we found that 45% uh, of our uh, members have a disability in some way, um, have some sort of disability. And so uh, we have a, a volunteer that's um, been on our team since the beginning that um, really, um, you know, opened my eyes so much to the fact that um, those who are disabled have such a harder time in um, seeking resources and seeking support. And so um, she, you know, lives in a rural area in Kansas as well. And so we actually find that a lot of our members are in rural areas and, um, and, it, you know, online support is, is the accessible support to them. So, um, anyways, that's, you know, I would say the accessibility part of it is probably the biggest advantage, um, to, um, to our, our group and technology in general, helping survivors. So if I can sort of open up that question to Kirsten and to Nicole for, you know, you're providing that crucial frontline service that women and children are coming into your shelter and asking for support. When you're chatting with them about how they reached your services, what, is their, what does their journey sound like or what is their experience and how many are returning to technology, such as groups like Hannah's to, to get the information that they need? Big right. Questions. Well, that, that's a great question, Lindsay. And I think that we find that you know, for each individual survivor, uh, their journey is different. And mm -hmm. so for some technology may be the perfect way to access help, um, whether it's through Hannah's group, which is wonderful, I think, um, whether it's through their local domestic violence program that has started and shifted to online groups during the pandemic and are continuing them as we are at Women's Center and Shelter because we found that they are so popular. Um, but, you know, at the same time, as we were just mentioning, technology may not be the root um, for others. So we find people coming through our doors, uh, you know, our virtual doors and our real life doors um, in, in as many different ways as we can imagine. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose when, you know, one of the things that technology can do just as you know, training can do and obviously information sharing and campaigning is that what we want to do as an ultimate goal is to enable those that are closest to people who are enduring domestic abuse to feel that they have the tools and the resources to be able to respond if they experience a disclosure. I think something that sort of always resonated and, you know, sat with me was that about 10, 15 years ago, there was a report made um, by Safe Lives in the UK who were able to identify that many survivors had spoken to at least 33 different people, agencies um, and professionals looking at act, trying to find the, the, the information for the support that they needed. And actually in many of those instances, the person they spoke to just didn't know how to respond effectively. And so sort of leading into that, I think I'd rather, I'd like to jump over and um, Ask Phil if he can give us a little bit of a, a, a story about where Are You Safe and Bright Sky sort of emerged from and really about how and why a tool like an app became a viable option um, way back when, when, when we started those early conversations. Sure, and thanks for having me. Um, so the app really started, uh, as, as a lot of these kind of things do, I think, uh, with a hallway conversation. At the time, uh, my team was sharing space with another firm and their founder was actually a board member at WCNS at the time. And, uh, you know, she knew my background, knew what my team did and asked if I would be interested in meeting with Women's Center and Shelter to talk about an idea they had. And that's where these things start. It always starts with an idea, right? Um, so from that conversation, that discussion and many, many more that followed uh, came the original Are You Safe app, and that was roughly 2013. Um, it was centered really just on risk assessment. I was, uh, it was interesting uh, what was said earlier about Googling, am I, you know, am I at risk, right? Am I in a, in a bad situation? And that's where this started. It was about putting a, a risk assessment tool in their hands and in, in folks' hands that needed it so that they could understand uh, their position. 
and we were happy to be involved. Fortunate enough um, with the position that my company was in and my team was in, we had the time and the expertise and we were able to donate that to, to bring that app to the market. Um, it wasn't until some time later that we actually learned uh, that the, my founder, the founder of the organization, uh, had a personal experience with DV. And uh, in his family, it was actually his mother. And um, he was extremely supportive after he found out what I had gotten us into. <laughs> so uh, I was kind of after the fact, uh, you know, ask uh, forgiveness, not permission, uh, but it, it all turned out for the best. So not long after that launch, um, through an employee in the company that was uh, actually in the UK, we were connected with Hestia. Uh, so Hestia is a, an organization in the UK that provides this kind of support. Uh, we ended up working with their team uh, and Pamela Zabala, who is now at No More, uh, you all know Pamela, uh, and developed the first Bright Sky app uh, with, and, and really added considerably more content uh, and some new features. That relationship, and, and, and that's a common theme, you know, partnerships and relationships, and that's how these things get off the ground. That relationship really continued through uh, in the 2018 when we got connected with the Thames Valley Partnership and the Vodafone Foundation. And with the addition of their support, we were not only to, able to add additional features to the app, uh, the Bright Sky app, and additional content. Uh, but that really gave us an opening to, to roll out to uh, additional markets, countries uh, across Europe. So I'm very proud to say that we're now in 13, 14 countries, 23 languages. Um, and here we are roughly 10 years later, and we've had the opportunity to come full circle and are really excited to be in a position where we can bring Bright, Bright Sky back to the U.S., merge it with Are You Safe and, and continue the work that we've been doing uh, with our friends at uh, Women's Center and Shelter. So you've led so perfectly into me asking um, Nicole to, to talk a little bit about the launch last week and the fact that we now have Bright Sky US. So I'll hand over to you, Nicole. Thank, Thank you so that. much, Lindsay. I would love to do that. That was a great intro, Phil. And uh, before I do that, I want to take one step back and just say how honored I am to be here today. Um, everybody on this call, the advocates, survivors, allies, I feel like we are each other's people, right? Um, so it is just such an honor. I know how busy everybody is. So thank you so much for being here with us today. And it really is such a joy and honor to talk about Bright Sky with you. So what is Bright Sky? You've heard Phil and a, a couple other folks talk about it. Bright Sky is a safe, free, and easy to use app and website. And what Bright Sky does is provide practical support and information on how to respond to domestic violence. As we've talked about, there's so many people approached who have no idea what to say to somebody who's disclosing that they are experiencing domestic violence. And so often, I know we all know what they say is, with good intentions, why don't you just leave? And of course, we also know that is the most dangerous time. And so the Bright Sky app is really for anyone, whether you are experiencing domestic violence and you want to learn more, whether you are concerned that you may be experiencing domestic violence, but you're not sure and you want to learn more, or whether you are concerned for somebody, a loved one, a coworker, a neighbor, anybody, who you think might be uh, experiencing domestic violence. So the Bright Sky app is really for, for anyone. Um, we are so excited to have launched the Bright Sky app last, last week. I was going to say last year. It's been a long week, but not that long. <laughs> last week in New York City um, in a parallel event that No More hosted with the uh, Commission on the Status of the 67th Commission on the Status of Women from the uh, United Nations, and it was very exciting. Um, but really, this is where the rubber hits the road, right? We can launch it, but we really need to tell people what it is and tell you how to use it and you know, ask you to use it and hope that it's another tool in the toolbox when you're working with survivors. Um, Women's Center is so honored to be working with Vodafone America's foundation and our partners that have been mentioned, but I will mention them again because as Phil mentioned, partnership is that critical. So domesticshelters.org, Aspirant, of course, No More, the Thames Valley Partnership um, have all been incredible partners over the last year uh, in doing this work and in being able to bring Bright Sky to you. So 
one of the critical aspects of what was are you safe, which we are sunsetting and as we are uh, launching Bright Sky in the United States. Uh, but one of the most important things is from this whole journey, we have known how important it is to involve survivors in all aspects because without, I mean, this is who we're working for, right? I mean, this is why we do our work. So we went to survivors and said, how do you think the Bright Sky app would have helped you in your journey. Now, everybody knows, as we were saying, everybody, every survivor's journey is different, but Bright Sky is one tool in our toolbox to help those experiencing domestic violence to learn more about what domestic violence is and reach out for help. So we asked survivors uh, how it would have helped them specifically, and these are some of the answers that we, we got. Um, first of all, one survivor said that it removes barriers to getting help because it's quick it's easy, it's free, and they can go at their own pace, which is so critical because we know, um, you know, you might reach out once and get the help you need. You might reach out, as Lindsay said, 33 times. Um, and all along that, that journey, there are places where, you're, where your own uh, ability to reach out for help can get stunted because of other people's reactions. But the app, you can go at your own pace. Um, the app doesn't judge. It's an app, right? You, you, you can just read the information at your own pace. Survivors have also said if they had bright sky, they could have learned red flags. They could have learned the signs of abuse. They could have learned about the different types of abuse, and it would have helped them to understand what they are experiencing or what they were concerned about, about experiencing more. They would have realized that they're experiencing domestic violence by learning of the different kinds of abuse, about coercion, about control, about all the different types of abuse. And very importantly, it's not just the learning, but it's the validation. They said that they would have felt validated in their experiences and known that there was help available. We also heard from survivors that, that being able to use the app would have helped to remove some of the shame and fear because there's a section in the app about dispelling myths and the education that provides can really help to empower folks who are going through this in their journey. They could have taken the risk assessment. They could have learned more about the potential danger of their own situation, which is so critical. Again, another way to empower people. Survivor, one, one specific survivor also talked in depth about that if she had had Bright Sky, she could have been connected to domestic violence specialists and she would have been more prepared. And as she said, less scared for her life in the aftermath when the police were called to their home, when their, their local child welfare agency was called to the home. Now, we know that these situations happen, right, all the time. But sometimes those outside of our field don't think about what happens then? They're in this home with the repercussions of their uh, the person who's abusing them, saying, "How did the police get called? Why did our why did our child welfare get called?" And we know how that can be very harmful to somebody who's experiencing domestic violence. So she, this particular advisor, uh, survivor said that she would have felt more prepared and she felt less scared for her life after these folks left and in that aftermath with her partner. So importantly, very importantly, survivors, survivors have said that it would have taken them less time, they believe, to be able to leave the abusive relationship. They would have found resources and help in their own time, and they would have felt empowered to be able to reach out for help. They've also said that Bright Sky breaks isolation, which makes sense, right? Because it can be accessed anywhere as long as you have that safe access to technology. And it shows they're not alone. I mean, an entire app was developed because of this, right? That's launched now in 13 countries. Clearly, no survivor of domestic violence should feel alone. And yet that is something we hear people say every single day of our work. But Bright Sky can really break that isolation. And, you know, we touched on this, but for many survivors who have reached out time and time again to family, to friends, to coworkers, um, and, and have not gotten answers that have been encouraging, uh, they said that the app doesn't judge them, that they didn't feel that shame, and it didn't, it, it really helped them in their journey because it just absolutely removed that judgmental part. And, you know, finally, it's, 
empowering, right? I mean, it empowers survivors and puts them back in the driver's seat of their own life, which I know is the goal of all of the work that we do. So that's why we at Women's Center and Shelter of Greater Pittsburgh um, felt that working on this app, the Bright Sky app was so critical and important because we know so many survivors need to, you know, be able to have access to this important information and education and risk assessment, online safety guides, um, and just know how to reach out to all of you across the country, which they can do through the domesticshelters.org powered database that's in uh, the Bright Sky app. So that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Nicole. You explained what Bright Sky is so eloquently again, and it's it's. Thank you. Um, I just want to take a minute, if possible, just to sort of go a little bit back a step and and sort of what Phil said in a way about the fact that he and his company took a chance um, on spending time and investing time, which was pro bono in both instances on creating the app was a huge part of this process. For many of us working in the sector, often we have phenomenal ideas. Um, you know, we have hundreds of them at every moment, but it takes that, you know, that opportunity of meeting the right person at the right time, who's gonna be able to say, that is an idea we can make real. And I just wanna say, you know, that is really key is that it's really important for all of us when we come with these ideas to reach out. There are organizations like Aspirin who are available and ready to put them into practice and to go forward with it. But I suppose leading a little bit further onto that is, is to, to bring June into the conversation for Vodafone America's foundation. And the fact that both June and the global um, Vodafone Foundation have invested so much time and commitment into rolling Bright Sky out across the world. Each one of those rollouts take, as we know, we've sat together over the past year nearly, a great deal of time. And then it's obviously about working locally with an NGO. June, can you tell me, tell us all a little bit about how it's how Bright Sky managed to roll out into so many different markets and perhaps some of the different experiences those rollouts have ever had? So um like Lindsay mentioned, I'm June Sugiyama, director of Vodafone America's Foundation. And just to go back a little bit, um, a Vodafone uh, is not that well known here in the United States. We're not an operating company. Um, but if you look back um, and uh, Google us, you'll find that we used to own 45% of Verizon. So we were an operator at one point. We are a global a telecommunications technology company. And um, I'm sure some of you are thinking it's so odd to see a corporation among so many incredibly passionate and dedicated individuals that work in the field of domestic violence. But um, Vodafone is, as, you, as I mentioned, in the vis business of technology. And we really knew a long time ago that technology can make a difference in people's lives. That's our business. Um, but um, as far as the, 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 the social community side of our foundation, uh, of, our, of our company, um, it's always been our philosophy to create a foundation wherever we have business. So we have 22 foundations worldwide. Every one of our charters is to use technology for good. Um, here in the United States, it's technology to empower women and girls. And why do corporations get involved with nonprofits and NGO is because they have the depth and breadth um, to be able to reach uh, people to use their apps, to be able to reach other partners, customers, employees. As a matter of fact, Vodafone ran a couple of studies about how domestic violence impacts um, workers and found that employees indeed are impacted by domestic violence and companies are impacted directly on the bottom line um, by domestic violence. And so we felt it's not only a, corp a personal need for our employees, but also a corporate uh, responsibility. Vodafone has an incredible um, awareness on, on taking care of their employees. They have a global, very generous global maternity policy, a diversity and inclusion policy, and after the studies, and um, launching some of these apps, um, they have a domestic violence policy as well. Um, just, we've been a partner with Phil for a long time and Phil has more historic, historic knowledge than I do, but 
like he mentioned, we're in 13 countries and working for more. Um, thus, you know, 23 languages. Here in the United States, we have three languages, Spanish and Chinese. Hopefully we can even do more. Um, and um, I, I think we've been lucky to be able to work with people like Phil and his company and also leverage our own employees from country to country. For example, I know our engineers in Hungary have been um, incredibly um, involved um, in um, improving the app. Um, how other countries have kind of um, reacted to the app. We've got several awards like in the Czech Rep Republic and Romania um, have, um, the communities have identified the app as important um, to the development and the well-being of their, um, of, of their community members. Um, and then I know in Italy, the, the users have taken it upon themselves to um, go on social media and even create like a booklet um, helping uh, survivors and users of the app. Um, Vodafone is incredibly, incredibly proud and fortunate to have all the partners here that we have on the screen and more. Um, this is, personally speaking, this is the first project that I've worked on that has so many partners but each of the partners have taken it on themselves of their own responsibility and their own expertise to, to get this thing going together and finally to be able to launch it here in the United States. Um, as you know, the US is um, made up of 15 um, countries, <laughs> actually 50 states that act like 50 countries. So in the beginning when I was approached, I, I, I actually declined many times, um, mainly because I felt the people who wanted to launch here in the United States didn't understand the terrain of, of the US. But then they mentioned to me that we already have a partner who is willing, like Nicole from Pittsburgh um, Women's Shelter that is on the ground and really know the field. And people like Lindsay and Pamela from No More who have global um, expertise, I felt that we can get this done. Um, in no way should a corporation on their own do this. Um, they, they don't have on the ground no knowledge. Um, they don't um, have um, uh, hands-on on the people in the community and our partners here do. And so we're really proud to be here and we're proud to be partners with everybody here. Um, and couldn't have done it last week um, without all of you. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jean. It really sort of sort of hits home in a way that we, you know, partnering with organizations like Vodafone Foundation enables us to, to benefit from your reach and expertise and to see how we've been able to learn so much from other countries and how it's been rolled out. We've benefited in our marketing and our experiencing what has worked and what hasn't worked and actually knowing that enabling those that are in direct contact with survivors and adding bright skies, Nicole so eloquently put it to the toolkit, um, their toolbox is really, really key and important. I suppose I know last week's, um, you know, webinar was very much focused on some of the risks around technology, but it feels wrong for us not to take a moment to think about putting an app on somebody's phone or advising someone to put an app onto their phone, and then this sort of, sort of risks that could be faced. And so I've sort of want to offer this question out to Hannah and then perhaps Kirsten and Nicole and maybe Sarah you're keen to jump in and obviously June and Phil if you'd like to too but you know when we talk about an app we are aware that many phones are monitored they are sometimes shadowed um what would be your sort of thoughts and advice about if you were recommending or suggesting to somebody to download Bright Sky Hannah shall I start with you yeah sure yeah um I think it's so um uh, amazing how aligned everything that Nicole was saying is exactly what we also achieve in, in speak your truth you know the the isolation and and the um, going at your own pace and um, anyways I just uh, I really identified with with what Nicole was sharing but um, but I can imagine that um, the fears in, involved are very similar as well um, we have a, a lot of fear 
um, when it comes to the safety of our group, and rightly so, because it is online and um, and uh, you know is somewhat public. We are a private group, and we screen everyone that comes through. We do a lot to maintain the safety within the group. Um, and we can share um, a, a link as well that kind of goes deeper into all the things that our volunteer team does to keep it safe. But you know, the first thing that comes to my mind when when you're talking about um, you know survivor safety and, and using technology and having the app on their phone or or being in our group in Facebook, um, you know, is really how can we empower the survivor to choose. Um, uh, you know, safety for themselves um, and choose the, the the best choices for themselves to maintain uh, their own safety. And and we do that um, in our group. Um, you know, once you're you're joined into our group, um, we have uh, a long um, kind of intro uh, pinned post called guides that we encourage deeply encourage our members to to read through seriously. And there's a whole section on how to keep yourself safe, how to lock down your your personal profile, how to um, um, you know uh, clean your browser caches and stuff like that. And so, um, so that's I mean that's what comes to mind to me. You know, obviously there's going to be um, you know so many um people that are in more risks than uh, or have more risks than than others um uh, and i you know i'm a strong believer that the accessibility and and the um you know the benefits of technology greatly outweigh the um the risk there but there there of course there there's going to be risks so um so anyways that's what com comes to mind for me thank you so much hannah i see your hand up there i'm jumping a call then i'll come to you because that's okay <laughs> Hannah, thank you for that. Yes, I would just I would just piggyback and say, you know, I think we really have to trust survivors to know on safety. I mean, really, we know our partners best. And, you know, what we find is that survivors are able to say, oh, yeah, you know, oh, my partner doesn't know anything about technology. My partner barely uses a smartphone versus my partner is an IT person or my person, my partner loves, you know, they have a hobby of, of IT, right? So they, you know, we trust survivors to know if it's safe to download or not. And this is one of the big reasons that we're really reaching out to um, friends and family and coworkers and neighbors and anybody, because it's not going to be safe for a lot of survivors to download Bright Sky. And we know that. And so if you are somebody who's concerned about your own situation, when you learn about Bright Sky, um, if you're taking a walk with your neighbor, you know, maybe say, hey, I, I heard about this great app. I'd love to check it out. You have your phone. Can we take a look, right? If you're not, if you're a survivor, but not really wanting to talk about, um, you know, your own situation, maybe. So that this is one of the big reasons because of safety that we are reaching out to kind of everybody who might be concerned about somebody who's experiencing domestic violence. So if a survivor can't download it for their phone, then they, they, they can possibly get someone else. And I'll just say, you know, we really encourage, and we're going to have the QR code for folks to go directly to the, to the, um, to the app. And, and Kristen will give you information on how to access the app and the website as well. Uh, but, you know, we really encourage you to look around on the app and see all of the different features that are very important, uh, we believe, to, to survivors and to those who love them. The only other thing I'll say is that we do have an online safety guide on the, on the uh, about to say, are you safe? Sorry, on the Bright Sky app. Um, so that should help uh, as well to navigate. So Kristen, did you want to add anything? Um, no, I mean, I think to your point and Hannah's just, you know, in this whole journey, and this sort of goes into my question, um, in this whole journey, it's been about survivor safety. And so I remember uh, sitting and having that first meeting back in, I think in 2012, um, you know, with our board member, with members from, you know, Newton Consulting at the time, which is now Aspirant, really just sitting around. It was a communications committee meeting talking about, you know, how can we reach survivors in a different way? Um, and so that's really where the Are You Safe app came from, but it, it really, safety is at the heart of everything we do. And we really have talked about it a few times, but every survivor knows their own safety. 
Um, it's not for us to decide. So I think just empowering survivors um, and understanding that they know their safety best and meeting them where they are is just really important. Thank you, Kristen. Sarah, you, I know you had something you'd like to add. I think, to be honest, everything's been covered. So I was just going to just take on what, what the other three have kind of said, is that the victims are the experts of their own life. Um, and that I think we just can't ever underestimate the knowledge and experience of survivors to know when and how it is safe um, to access support and when to actually download the app. And that's something which has come up, I suppose, a few times um, over the years with the UK version of, of Bright Sky. Um, and when we promote Bright Sky, we always include kind of like a caveat sentence around the risk and encourage um, where possible, if it's not safe for you to access the app yourself, to download on a trusted friend or, or family member's phone. But yeah. Thanks so much, Vera. So jumping across to you, Chris, and to ask you a direct question. <laughs> I think we've sort of touched on it a little bit, and I know it's something that is um, incredibly important in the way that we will continue to roll out Bright Sky. But I think one of the, along with the fact that Bright Sky is survivor led, if you wanted to talk a little bit more about that particular piece about how the aspects of Bright Sky were, were developed and derived, but actually the whole of Bright Sky in its entirety is built on the concept of partnerships and working with different people from different aspects of the community and with different expertise and meeting everybody into a space where we're able to share and collectively do this um, together. And obviously that includes all our partners across the world um, so can you talk a little bit about both of those things if possible? Sure. Yeah, I think we've touched on it um, a few times, but this idea of involving survivors is incredibly important. And so um, from the very beginning of the process, we involve survivors in the testing phase and sort of the content and um, throughout months, just having them test the app to provide really important feedback. Um, and I think throughout the content, we really used our collective knowledge in working with survivors all these years, you know, with Women's Center and Shelter, DomesticShelters.org, No More, using our collective knowledge in working with survivors, uh, because words really do matter, and sometimes it's just tweaking. I know, you know, we would sometimes spend 10 or 15 minutes on one sentence, um, but it matters, and it's really important, and we wanted to make sure um, that the content was really reflective of a journey and really making sure um, that survi survivors' voices were heard um, within the app. And, and that's content, it's the videos, um, even down to the marketing and PR, we wanted to ensure that survivors were involved throughout the whole process uh, because it's really important. And like Nicole said, um, we've also talked to survivors too um, about the app, you know, could it have helped you? Um, I had uh, pulled a, su a survivor we talked to as well, and she had said, um, having experienced partner violence myself, I tended to minimize my experience. Um, this educational section helped me to explain and validate the different types of abuse and how it presents. Sometimes we don't want to admit that we were being abused, so this puts things into perspective. Um, so I think, you know, just even having the forms of abuse, having um, that to help validate survivors and what they're experiencing is really important. Um, so working with survivors throughout this whole process and continuing throughout, I mean, like we've talked about the launch was last Thursday, but it doesn't end there. We want to continue to involve survivors in this journey, in this process, um, ensuring that their voices are heard um, and really uh, ensuring that that continues is really important to us. Um, the other, you know, just about partnerships, um, you know, we've been working on this project for, well, I've been, you know, working on the Are You Safe um, app and, and with Phil since about 2012 and it launched in 2013. Um, so it's been really incredible to sort of see this come full circle, but um, just all of the partners. And when you get involved in a partnership, you think there are a lot of partners, a lot of meetings, a lot of schedules. Um, but I think what has been great is that we've all brought different knowledge to the table. We've worked with different people, with different partners in our own realms, and we've been able to use that to strengthen Bright Sky, like we've talked about now in 13 countries, um, and it helps us to broaden the reach. So we're able to sort of bring all of our networks together um, and reach more survivors, which is really the ultimate goal. So, you know, bringing the business sector together, um, those from the foundation community, the nonprofit communities, 
these kinds of partnerships are incredibly powerful because um, you're able to just increase your reach, um, ultimately helping survivors. And as we've talked about, helping friends, family, and colleagues, which is incredibly important um, because like we've talked about, it might not always be safe to have um, a survivor download the app, um, but those of us advocates in the field, friends, family, it's really it's a really important tool. And I think it's only been strengthened by all of these incredible partnerships that we've been able to build. Thank you so much. And I think you're absolutely right. It's often, you know, we, we when delivering the support, when working as an advocate, often you're very much in the midst of every the practical responses, but actually having those moments where you can reach out and engage with other professionals like these types of webinars can be incredibly powerful with strengthening your networks. And, you know, we are more powerful when we are together and, and the knowledge we've shared and been able to build on has been phenomenal. So we've spoken a little bit about it, and a lot of our conversation we've had today is focused on Bright Sky and tools and resources and technology, which are geared towards, you know, um, or aimed towards the survival of somebody who's enduring domestic abuse. But I think sort of we do have that other group of people who we've just about touched on, which are the friends, the family members, the, the employees, the colleagues at work who are often seeing things. Uh, or identifying some unhealthy behaviors in relationships are perhaps too afraid to get involved or, or feel for themselves that actually, you know, if I do open this tin of worms, I won't know what to do and how to access support. And I think, you know, one of the key things is often like, if I do ask the question, how do I put somebody in contact with that specialist support service? You know, and a big shout out to domesticshelters.org for being able to provide that directory within, within the app. And I think that's really crucial. If you're in that moment as a friend or a family, member you need a one-stop shop to be able to find that support and I think you know offering and doing that partnership and being able to offer your resources being crucial for Bright Sky to to be sort of have the place that it does. In saying all of that I think there's also a practical element to Bright Sky in the sense that it can underpin some really great programs um, and I'm going to invite Sarah to talk a little bit about the Safe Spaces program in the UK and actually how Bright Sky in itself you know, it's been in the UK since 2016, and obviously the second iteration with Vodafone Foundation and Thames Valley Partnerships in 2018. But there was a struggle, and I think you may agree with me, or may of getting a, a Bright Sky becoming a tool in everybody's tool belt, toolbox. And it wasn't until we were able to sort of enable friends and family members, and in, in particular employees, to be able to use it as a resource that it became something really valuable. And then obviously COVID happened. So. Sarah, do you want to talk a little bit about that experience and how safe spaces emerge and how Bright Sky has a part in it? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, and fantastic to be here today. So thank you for inviting me. Um, so Safe Spaces is a um, partnership based solution which um, increases pathways for victims of domestic abuse to access support as safely as possible. Um, we have um, always used Bright Sky, I suppose, as the tool of UK Says No More, as the tool of the campaign. Um, and when the global pandemic hit, that, as Lindsay referenced, is that like many um, specialist domestic abuse services and campaigns, um, not just in the UK, but across the world, you know, all of us, our first response was to those who are at home with the perpetrators, those who are enduring domestic abuse. Um, you know, we were told to stay at home and stay safe. Um, and the reality was that for many victims of domestic abuse, home was just not that safe place. It was actually quite a terrifying and dangerous place. So we wanted to create um, a way to and find a way to kind of increase opportunities for victims of domestic abuse to access support um, with the places which were open during the pandemic um, as safely as possible. So we mobilised very quickly, um, thanks to our incredible partners, um, which we had as the campaign. And I think it was within, it was by May 2020, I think, wasn't it, Lindsay? It was only like six weeks after um, the UK lockdown measures were announced um, by the government, we um, nationally rolled out safe spaces as a self-service scheme in pharmacies. Um, and then since the lockdown um, and restrictions have eased well, and now have ended, um, our partners have kind of committed to continue safe spaces um, beyond the pandemic as they kind of really understand that now more than ever, we need those partnership based solutions we've been discussing today. Um, so um, currently we have safe spaces in one in three pharmacies um, across the UK and we've expanded into four national banks. Um, and we currently have a um, pilot in job centres too. So I think it's just over, yeah, it's over 7,000 safe spaces we have in total across the UK. 
Um, we've had great success um, with um, lots of media success and, um, and lots of different launches and also lots of feedback from survivors, which is the, the most important thing at the heart of everything which we do too. Um, we've had a lot of endorsement from um, celebrities, um, social media influencers, um, but we've also um, even had the Queen Consort Camilla um, visit one of our safe spaces in London too, which was um, very special. Um, everything we do, and I've echo a lot of what everyone's been discussing today everything we do is very survivor led um, and we deliver everything kind of in consultation so uh, each partner who kind of adopts safe spaces commits to um kind of quality assurance and um, honoring the victim's journey and of course a part of that is downloading and utilizing bright sky um on their on their work devices as the kind of tool to not only support the victims who are using the safe spaces but also for their employees who may be kind of enduring domestic abuse too um, so to access a safe space, you just walk into kind of any participating pharmacy, bank or job centre across the UK. Um, you ask at the healthcare centre, uh, healthcare counter, sorry, um, for um, pharmacies, or it may be just a member of staff in the bank or the job centre. Simply just, can I, can I use your safe space? Um, the victim will be shown to the safe space, which is the consultation room for pharmacies or a private room for, for banks and for job centres. And then once they're inside, um, there will be two posters which will be displayed inside the safe space. One is the National um, Domestic Abuse Awareness um, kind of poster for the National Domestic Abuse Helpline, subject to what country they're in across the UK. There's four countries and only four countries for us within, the, within there. And, um, and then the other is the UK's um, Bright Sky app, which is there on, on the poster. Um, whilst they're inside the safe space, what that safe space allows for a victim is, is a moment for them to exhale. It's a moment for them to pause, take a moment to really collect their thoughts and make an informed decision as to really what it is that they want to do. It's a space for them to gain back that choice and that control. Um, it's an opportunity for them to contact uh, maybe a family member, which they haven't been able to contact for so long. That's actually from the feedback we've had from survivors, the first call they make is not to download the Bright Skies, not to call the National Domestic Abuse Helplines. It's actually to call a loved one to say, I'm safe and I'm in X, Y and Z safe space and, and I'm going to access support and, and I'm going to find a way out. Um, and then, of course, the second thing which they do after they call their loved one is to download um, Bright Sky um, and use its many functions. So it may be to utilise the um, directory, so to contact the local support services. Um, it may be to... Um, like use the self-assessment questionnaire or it simply might be just to find out more about their situation have that bit of a light bulb moment and then kind of see what their actual options actually are um bright sky is very much um the tool of safe spaces um, it's like as we like to call it the digital pathway for victims to access support in a safe space um which is why we then went on to create online safe spaces um which is also um what Bright Sky is also the tool of. Um, we launched um, uh, online safe space, I think it was about September 2020, I think, and we delivered that in partnership with the Royal Mail Group. Um, and online safe spaces is just a widget which you can add onto your website for free. Um, it's Sorry, I was meant to turn off all of my alarms and this one didn't go off. Um, but it's a widget which you can add onto your website for free. Um, in our case, the widget is the Safe Spaces logo, um, which features the internationally recognised symbol, of course, which is the, the, the no more blue pin. Um, so whilst you're um, maybe um, online um, on a website, you might be paying for um, your gas or water bill. It might be that you're buying like a train ticket. You might be doing some online shopping. Whatever you're online for is that we've got a variation of different businesses which have, who have adopted, luckily, online safe spaces. But where you see the, uh, the online safe spaces logo, you can click on it and it acts as a, a discrete pathway to specialist domestic abuse information. It takes you to an untraceable page which features um, functions of Bright Sky, of, of the Bright Sky app. So it features the comprehensive directory of all the local services across the UK. It features um, of Bright Sky, it features the multiple language selection of Bright Sky, and it also has the self assessment um, questionnaire as well. And one of the survivors um, of online safe spaces who, who used online safe spaces in particular, um, in particular, they used the self assessment questionnaire. And actually, it was the piece which somebody's already talked about before. But I had a, a survivor kind of disclose to me that 
when she used the self-assessment function of, you know, on of Bright Sky on online safe spaces, it was like a self-reflective moment of realization for her that what they were experiencing was in fact actually domestic abuse and the threat that she felt against her life was real and it was very much valid. And we've had a lot of feedback similar to that, you know, from from lots of different survivors who have used Bright Sky in one way or, or form or another, you know, whether or not it be through safe spaces or it might have been through online safe spaces. And it's been incredibly powerful um, and, and navigated us way to kind of create more pathways for, for victims to access as much support as possible. And since we've launched online safe spaces, um, we've had over 70 organisations adopt. Um, from a variation of different fields, which has been fabulous. Um, but it's also been used over 1.5 million times, um, which is incredible. Um, and then also since launching online safe spaces, we've also had a lot of um, lessons learned. Um, we've made significant accessibility updates to our UK version um, of Bright Sky. Um, for example, some organisations have um, kind of legal accessibility requirements. So we have implemented this kind of within our online safe spaces, ensuring that it's, access, it's, it's as accessible as possible um, and that it meets all of the accessibility kind of eligibility criterias and ultimately allows more businesses really to adopt online safe spaces and creates more pathways really for victims to, to access support. Um, we've had a lot of internationally expressed interest, which has been um, overwhelming. It's been amazing. Um, interest to adopt not only safe spaces, but online safe spaces. Uh, we've had interest from America, Canada, Australia, um, France, Italy, I think, for the, the latest ones, um, and South Africa. Um, it's all been very exciting. And I think what I find the most exciting of all of this is the more countries that adopt and develop Bright Sky, the more Bright Sky can be utilised as a tool to really kind of like create pathways for victims in that specific country to access support. And that's what we're all working towards. Um, so it's very exciting that Bright Sky has, has launched in the US. Um, it's fabulous to see Lindsay being a part of all of this. Um, I very much look forward to seeing what comes next and what kind of innovative digital solutions um, Bright, your Bright Sky can be a part of within the US and look forward to being a part of that too. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I just feel like it's it's really important to sort of add in that one of the, the key selling points in those early days of, of safe spaces and getting our pharmacies and, and boots and everyone involved was delivering a level of training that felt comfortable and suitable to staff members working inside these pharmacies. And you know, and that's a tough, tough order, as we all know, you know, part of us as advocates and working within the sector want to give as much information as possible to everybody who will come into direct contact with a survivor. But I think one of the things that we were able to do is provide a very comfortable level of information, which was very much backed up and supported by the tools and resources within Bright Sky. And so I think, again, uh, you know, I always shout and would always encourage that notion of if you don't ask, if you don't challenge, if you don't try and push yourself into those partnerships and create those opportunities for conversation, great things can't, you know, won't happen. And I think this is evidence of that is that sometimes you've just got to keep on asking. And if there's anyone who does that brilliantly, it's definitely Sarah. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, I suppose just before we, you know, we move on to sort of the questions from the rest of the group and sort of a, a bit over you of how you can download Bright Sky today in particular, we've we've only we've explored a couple of options of, of where technology can be really helpful. One is in using existing tools and resources such as um, Facebook or um, other online platforms and creating those safe spaces within that platform. We've spoke about Bright Sky and I've been seeing in some of the comments and questions coming up, lots of people mentioning other forms of technology that can be useful and, and can be used to provide support. And you know, we can't forget the resources and the incredible library of, of web and information that domesticshelters.org offers. Um, but I want to ask this question, you know, we're always thinking about big ideas and what comes next. Where else do you think to the whole panel in some ways? Um, I'll start with you, Phil, <laughs> put you in the deep end on this, is where technology can continue to expand into providing opportunities and um, new ways that we can provide support to those people who are enduring domestic abuse, and most importantly, their children. Sure. Um, so it's interesting. I, 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 there's a couple of things I wanted to comment as we were going along first. Uh, I, I think it's really important to understand 
the context of technology and not, I think too often when people hear, how do we apply technology to a problem? The first thing they think of is, how do we apply the latest technology to a problem? And, and that's really not what's important. Um, and, and I'll use, you know, we had several folks comment about the content of the app and uh, kind of compounding that the use of, of online safe spaces, which uses, again, uses the content. The, 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 the win, I believe, at least here with Bright Sky is probably a little bit less about specifically the technology and more about bringing the content together in a way that allows us to use the technology to provide that content through many different means, whether it's the app on a person's phone, it's a website, it's a widget that corporations or other organizations can apply to their website. It all comes back to a, a centralized set of content. And, and we talked about how much work it takes to, uh, to bring the app to market. That work is not on necessarily the technology side. That work, is, the technology has been done. That work is on understanding the content, understanding the problem, and, and really creating the material necessary. The app itself, the technology is just a tool. Uh, it, it's just the means by which we're delivering that information. Uh, so I, I, I'm not really, I, I appreciate that I'm not really answering your question, but I, I felt it was really important to, to make that distinction that, you know, technology for technology's sake is, is not the answer. What, what we, we need to understand that the technology is a tool in the belt. It's a way that we can reach people, whether it's through their phone or their watch or their you know, uh, the website or, you know, uh, online shopping, whatever that is, the real work that has been done and, and the real value, I think anyway, of, of everything that's happened over the last 10 years is really bringing together all of this information and whether it's in Italy or Romania or the Czech Republic and what we've learned as we go through each of these countries is the differences, right, in that content, the differences in how the police respond, the differences in how national organizations are made available, all of that. That's the real power of the application um, and, and, and the real power of Bright Sky. So I apologize for not really answering your question, uh, but uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really just important. And being a technologist by, by, you know, by trade, I, I think it's kind of ironic that I'm saying that you know, downplaying the technology side of it, but just understanding the technology is the tool um, and we can apply that tool in a lot of different ways. Uh, and uh, it doesn't always have to be what's the most recent cutting edge application, you know, let's use AI or something like that. I think too often we get tied up in, in, um, in thinking in terms of the latest technology versus the right technology. Perfect answer, Phil. Thank you so, <laughs> so much. <laughs> That's exactly what we needed to hear. June, I'll hand over to you because you got your hand up. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, thank you for letting me speak here. I was just itching when you asked that question. I was just itching and totally agree with um, Phil um, and pure irony that I'm speaking from a technology company uh, to say technology is not the end all be all. I've been working in technology for a few years now looking for um, um, the latest innovation for solving um, critical social issues around the world. And some of the best apps, uh, innovations, and the, and, and the solutions that have really worked are the ones that have the following. One, that it's inclusive, that includes the people who are going to use whatever this technology is going to be. And then second, that the first iteration is never the end all, right? You have to keep on improving it. And I think, Lindsay, that's where the opportunity is. You know, we have people in the audience that are from all kinds of fields of domestic violence in itself. And so with a combination with listening to them, not only listening to the survivors, but listening to um, the providers and, and um, listening to some of the family members and so forth. And so I think that's the great opportunity to be able to improve. And, um, you know, with any new technology, there, there's always an inherent risk 
I mean, I'm an OG. I've, I've been working for years. You can tell by my gray hair. Um, but when you look back to the telephone, right, when the telephone was, you know, first discovered, it was like the greatest engineering feat. But then, then, then came lots of other things that came along with it. You know, the people who use it for harm, the people who use it to, um, um, to, to, um, to, to take money off of other people and things like that. So I'm an OG. I have experience to know that um, the first iteration is always not always it, that people like Phil on our company and also our users and um, our providers com continuously feeding in makes it better. Um, and then the, the last ingredient that, that's really the qualification is the end result, the final goal should always be, in our case, the survivor, right? So always keeping that in mind. Um, you know, in business case, people are always thinking of money and the bottom line, it's not that. And, you know, maybe in the nonprofits case, they're thinking about the number of downloads and how we need to improve that. But really the end result should be the survivor and how this new technology can help. Thank you, Lindsay. No, thank you, Jean. I think you, that was definitely needed to be, and it certainly couldn't be put. Um, we only have a couple more minutes before we go into a QA, and and I want to give Kirsten the chance to really sort of explain how you can download Bite Sky. So I'm not sure, Hannah or Sarah, if you'd like to add anything. I'll just add that, um, you know, one time someone told me that, um, you know, survivors are really innovative. And I think um, you just, you know, again, to your point, June, that like um, mm -hmm. listening to survivors and their voice and, and um, what they need coming out of abuse is um, going to be, I think, what um, really pushes us forward in the domestic violence space. And, and, um, and I mean, we're really new to the domestic violence space, but I would also add that um, you know, it seems like partnerships, um, just continuing to, to grow partnerships amongst um, the domestic violence space. Every, you know, we all have the same, you know, mission and the more that we can collaborate and, um, and improve the journey to um, support and freedom for survivors is obviously the goal, so. Thank you. Sarah, did you want to add anything? Um, I just want to just just kind of echo what everyone's saying really about um, everything being kind of survivor led and kind of survivor kind of involvement and that kind of consultation piece is like really important and um, I think one of the things that we've kind of focused on is rather than I suppose obviously we created obviously online safe spaces but instead of like creating something new it's how we can actually reach more victims of domestic abuse that know so we've created online safe spaces how can we reach now victims to let them know that this exists and it's all in the promotional work but it's utilizing digital methods um in order to reach more victims to make them aware that these these digital solutions exist so again lots of partnership based solutions um are really key to um digital solutions around kind of like domestic abuse and promoting once you've kind of got those in place and I suppose what we've done um with a lot of our kind of partners is utilize their resources that they have and their reach and um, to raise awareness of bright sky um and kind of to reach more victims of domestic abuse so for example we've got like a store locator a gps store locator on our website which then has a list of all the safe spaces we've got online safe spaces we've got We've utilized kind of QR codes on um, like toilet posters, petrol pumps, till receipts, et cetera, reaching day to day more, more victims on, in, in day to day kind of shops, et cetera. Um, and then also kind of utilizing email signatures and screen savers at work and those kind of things which, you know, small things, which small changes which um, organizations can do. But it reaches so many people, you know, so many employees that are working there, et cetera. So. Yeah, it's just utilizing those digital uh, methods, really. Nicole, is there anything you want to add before I pass over to Kristen to tell us where we can get Bright Sky? Nope, take it away, Kristen. <laughs> All right. And just um, speaking of outreach, we just launched um, last Thursday. So we you will be hearing from us. We're sort of just starting the outreach. Um, we're going to be doing, you know, we're doing some social media. 
some Google ads, but we also have a huge sort of grassroots campaign that we'll be starting and have started. So um, we look forward to doing more outreach. So anyone can download the app at no cost um, in the app store um, or on Google Play. So it is available for iPhones, uh, Android phones at no cost. Uh, there is a desktop version of the app at us.bright-sky.org. Um, so it's the app just on a desktop form. And then we also created a page that's really just helping people to understand more about the app. And then it also helps people understand how to become an advocate. And that's brightskyus.org. Um, so that's really all of the information. And we'll also be creating a toolkit that will be available to advocates around the country so that you're also able to have access to um, you know, uh, all that you need to be able to help us promote Bright Sky, which ultimately helps survivors. So we appreciate all of your help um, in promoting Bright Sky. And we're really excited to just reach more people, um, not only survivors, but those who love them. So thank you. Oh, thank you. And I just want to say a massive thank you for joining us today in this conversation and obviously all the panelists for, for your input. I think the couple of things that jump out to me will always be that we do better together. So partnerships are key. Keeping things simple is often the key and not having to overburden ourselves with advancements and, and technology and actually what we know and how we bring that to the people who need it most is really key. And I think what Hannah said is sort of really, really important in this moment is that we all do this for the same reason, and that's to provide support and enable those who are enduring domestic abuse and their children to move to a place of safety, and that collectively we are stronger. So I want to pass this over to Ashley and a great big thank you again to DomesticShelters.org for allowing us the space to have this conversation and for you for joining us. But yeah. Wonderful. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation. I, I really appreciate you all being here. We did get a lot of questions that came in. Um, I promise I didn't plant this question, but um, this one is about Bright Sky. Is it available in Canada? Um, so the, the DomesticShelters.org uh, database obviously also um, you know, serves uh, Canada as well as the United States. And so secretly, I'm hoping that eventually we can, can uh, launch the Bright Sky app there. But I guess I'm going to answer my own question and say, no, it's not currently available. But if anyone on the team wants to, to, to weigh in on any um, thoughts about uh, expanding the app to Canada, would love to, to hear that as well. Okay. I, I guess I will. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a lot of. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we would obviously love to. Uh, I, I think uh, I I happen to be sneaking a look at the at the Q and A as well, and and very excited by that question. Um, yes, we would be looking for partners. I, I think uh, the place to start would be to 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 shoot me an email. I'm assuming that my contact information will be made available in some form. Um, but if anybody is interested, uh, and would like to further that conversation, love to have it. Um, it'll take partners as we have, have said, you know, throughout this entire, uh, uh, conversation, but would be happy to have that conversation. Absolutely. Fantastic. Um, the next question I uh, would love to hear and, and maybe. Lindsay, if you want to assign out these questions as they come in, I'm not sure who the best person is to answer, but um, can you talk more about Bright Sky's safety features for victims, um, like being able to hide the app on your phone uh, in case an abuser is looking through it? I know that um, there is some kind of, um, you know, attempt to not talk too openly about these, but I'm hoping we can share a little bit about, um, you know, how the app is designed in a way to keep it safe. Um, Kristen, are you able to answer that, I think, or Nicole? I just jumped into I think this. either one of us is fine. I want to make sure. I know we're not supposed to talk <laughs> about those features. So I don't, um, th so there are features. Um, it is a, an app that can appear as something else on your phone. So there are features that um, make the app appear as something else. Uh, and then also if someone were to walk in the room, there is a quick escape, much like many of our websites. Um, for those of us in the field, uh, most of us have a quick exit. Um, so that is a, a safety feature. So um, there is also a tool that allows survivors um, to walk through their journey and there is a safe way to do so. I'm not sure if I'm saying that in a way that is safe. <laughs> talking about it, but not talking about it. 
Um, and there, you know, I, I think one of the things um, we would encourage you to look through the app, I think, uh, before you sort of start talking about it, there's also a training video on um, brightskyus.org that sort of walks through some of the features, but there are safety features, there are um, assessments, guides, videos that really are helpful, again, to survivors, to advocates, and to friends and family with safety in all of it, um, at the heart of all of it. So I think that's a good way of saying that there are safety um, features that are uh, helpful to everybody um, who uses the app. And I think I'd just add that on the point of download, all of the opportunities um, become very apparent. Yes, <laughs> skirting around an issue there. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I think to add also the name Right Sky, right, was also chose because it's not uh, specific to domestic violence. It's very, you know, in innocuous of, of what it means. So uh, I think that was a brilliant uh, choice early on in, in this uh, process. Um, I do have one question that's directed specifically for Hannah, and then we've got a, a I will try to get through as many um, more specific questions on Bright Sky. Um, for Hannah, it was, uh, how can we provide support online for survivors who remain in the abusive relationship um, who do not have privacy from the abuser? Is that something that you've been able to accomplish through the Speaker Truth Today Facebook group? Yeah, actually, um, we have uh, at a, a large scale, something that I, I actually didn't touch earlier, but um, but I'm into. <laughs> um, we we have this feature called the anonymous posting feature that um, that Facebook has made available to us. And we actually before it was a feature, our admins and volunteers were posting anonymously on behalf of our members. Um, so now that it's a feature, it's really cool because the um, the user can also respond to comments anonymously as well. So there, the um, it's a massive feature in the in the group, which makes it really important. Especially, we we highly encourage um, and, and sometimes um, uh, request members to resubmit anonymously for their own safety if they are disclosing. Some, our our volunteers do that um, if they're still in custody battles or they're. Um, in the court systems or um, still with their um, abusive partners. So, um, I, I mean, that's the way that we're doing it, um, you know, in our support group. Um, and uh, and again, I think it, this goes back to the conversation of, um, of empowering the survivor to, um, to make their own uh, safe choices. And so um, we, we do a lot in order to, um, to really empower the survivor to make those safe choices. So um, yes, it's totally possible in, the, in our support group, you know, that's the context that I'm coming from. So um, there's uh, a lot of ways that we do that in the support group. And I highly encourage you to, to join the support group, even if you're an advocate. Um, we especially like advocates in the group, you know, that can um, provide, um, um, you know, great resources and, and um, links. And, uh, and, you know, yeah, that I can really go on and on about it, but it's really <laughs> hard to explain it unless uh, you're in the group. Yeah, but um, yes, there are lots of ways that we're able to um, really educate and help prepare um, survivors to make that jump um, while they're still in the relationship. So fantastic. Thank you very much, Hannah. Um, so we're going to fly through hopefully a few um, questions that probably have yes or no answers, um, but feel free to elaborate where needed. Um, the first question about Bright Sky is, what personal information does Bright Sky ask for? Uh, Any none. None. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Phil. Okay, we'll leave it at that. I think that that's a great answer so we can get through some more here. And I believe I know the answer. Well, actually, I don't know the answer to this. Does Bright Sky require a minimum age to use? No, no. So anyone can use use the tool uh, because right there's no there's no risk of you know it's it's really an educational tool Rob, that anyone at any age can can benefit from. So fantastic. It's um, also it's really useful to use if you're concerned that your young person or teenagers in a relationship. It's a great way to start a conversation. Some of those at are you at risk questionnaires. But sorry, no, that's mm -hmm. great. very very on point. Um, the next two questions I believe are regarding kind of the target audience of the app and who it's for um, from, from a standpoint of, um, so the first question is, is Bright Sky designed specifically for women or can it help male or gender fluid victims? Uh, does the app recognize the nuances and the differences in abuse that men, women, and other genders may experience? The Bright Sky app is absolutely for any survivor, period, mm -hmm. end of sentence. 
Yeah. And we hope that everybody from everywhere will use it. And feels represented. It was a, a big yes. part, of a, part of our development process to ensure that. Yes. Yeah. That's great to understand that it wasn't just, you know, because it's easy to say something is, is meant for everyone, but obviously there was a conscious effort going through each of the questions and the resources to make sure that uh, yeah, everyone everyone has something that they can uh, can find helpful. So that's great to see. And um, does the Bright Sky incorporate culturally specific resources for marginalized groups? We hope so. Again, it was part of it was specifically looked at. And we know that we can always add more resources um, and links, and we have taken a conscious effort to try and include as many as possible. But Kristen, I think I just. No, yeah, no, I think it's, we were very intentional um, in trying to be as inclusive as we possibly can. We're always open to feedback, um, but I think, you know, all of us, again, in creating this great partnership, we all came together and really talked about we wanted this app um, to be inclusive and representative, and so we're hopeful it does that. Um, so, yeah, it, it's uh, inclusive and uh, definitely in all of the resources we made available um, in the language, we tried to be as inclusive um, as possible. Fantastic. Well, that is all the time we have for questions. Um, I do want to give Lindsay, if you have any kind of parting words before I kind of wrap things up here, um, I'll turn it over to you for just a minute. I just, I just think that um, I suppose I may speak on behalf of everyone in this is this process, but being on this journey of developing Bright Sky from, you know, meeting Chris and Phil Roy back in 2016, but also seeing how it's continued to grow and develop has been incredible and to have learned so much from so many great people I feel incredibly honored and I, I'm sure I'm speaking for everyone else to say that together you know we can do so much and we look forward to being able to do more and if Canada gets an once an app and we can make that happen you know that will be amazing um, you know with every new app we learn so much and so thank you so so much. Fantastic. Well, thank you everyone for being a part of today's conversation. Um, I hope that any everyone who's joined today or anyone who's you know looking to start some kind of technology-based solution for survivors, you know, found some helpful pieces of information that they can apply to their efforts. Uh, but also hopefully you learned more about the specific tool of, of Bright Sky. Um, and it was obviously it was really great to see the positive feedback in the chat, specifically people asking how they can within their own organization, you know, spread the word about the app. So we'll include that advocate toolkit uh, link in the shared resources, um, which will be ready at the beginning of next week. Um, so we'll send send the link out uh, within the next week. And uh, we'll also send out a webinar recording so you can listen back, play back, share with other people on your team to help them uh, learn uh, the same things that you learned from this conversation. We also have a transcript, certificate of, of attendance, and like I said, that shared resources folder. Um, so thank you again to Nicole, Kristen, Phil, Sarah, June, Hannah, and Lindsay for joining us today and to everyone who uh, tuned in. Uh, we'll also send a survey out today, which will be a great space if you have any feedback um, from either your thoughts on the app initially, or maybe if you've had a chance to look at through it already, would love to collect that feedback there. So with that, we'll go ahead and conclude today's presentation. Thank you everyone and have a wonderful day.